Um, okay, so this is Frontiers of AI Arts. I think that's what I called it. Um, you're looking at some images from OpenAI Gym. It has nothing to do with what we're going to talk about today, but it's just kind of cool, so I'd like to include it. Um, just a quick show of hands. How many people are going to be with me tomorrow also for the... Okay, just, just like a handful, maybe maybe a third of you. Uh, the name of it is uh, Autonomous Artificial Artist, I think, or Introduction to Abraham, something like that. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so yeah, basically we're going to talk about a few things today. And um, I want to preface this by saying, um, by, by talking about kind of the motivation for this. We're, I'm, I'm kind of thinking about what is next in this AI arts field. It's been something that's been interesting to me for, for a while, um, and we've come a very long way. So I started working with generative models maybe five or six years ago when, when sort of deep generative models became, became a thing. And I can tell you that we were really lucky back in the day to get 32 pixels. You know, So these were very dark times in the history of, of GANs and autoencoders and stuff like that. It was really kind of like, was, like I don't want to say it was like the depression, but just it was something really terrible. You know, just think of the worst, worst time in your life. This was what it was like back in the dark ages of GANs. Um, things have come uh, a really, really long way. So this is work from last year um, by um, Andrew Brock at DeepMind where they were basically creating photorealistic versions of dogs and butterflies and hamburgers and all sorts of stuff. It's really, really a lot of progress over the last few years in terms of making hyper-realistic generative models. This is actually a tweet from Ian Goodfellow about it where he showed the progress of GANs, uh, generative adversarial networks for those, for those who haven't heard of them, in um, the progress that they've made over the last four and a half years from very, very low resolution, black and white, very blurry, to what's over here in the right, sort of a hyper-realistic face. Um, and actually, this doesn't do it justice because if you look at it to actual scale, this is the progress. It's been going from basically these smudges on the screen pretty much, just you know, a thousand square pixels, um, to a million square pixels. Uh, back last year, and if you extrapolate this out to one or two years from now, it's going to be basically the point that we can model the entire world to, to pixel perfect resolution. Yeah. Is the improvement on the uh, efficiency of the algorithm that generates this, or is it also kind of using the fact that we have a million views that can be much faster? It's more of the latter, but it's both. Um, it's definitely been just a lot of just throwing compute and data uh, at, at it. Um, but there's also been algorithmic improvements. So these are kind of using this up sampling, this sort of staged version of GANs where it keeps on getting a low resolution version and then upscaling it by a factor of two and then kind of progressing. Um, but, but for the most part, it's, it's the same basic techniques uh, from the last five years. Um, so things like deep fakes have been in the public consciousness for, for now maybe let's say two years. This is kind of what they looked like in 2016. This is what they look like now. Um, you, can, you can really very highly realistically model people's faces, um, sometimes from just one image. Um, there's new research that indicates how you can do that. Um, and so the question that I want to pose in this uh, in this session today is what's next? Where do we go from here? Um, because uh, how many of you are, have been ITP students or are ITP students? Okay, so just, just not, not so many of you, but um, but yeah, it's been, the last few years have machine learning has been a big topic here. And uh, I think people have explored a lot of different avenues. We've worked with a lot of different interesting algorithms. And now things are getting to the point where where new directions are forming. The field is actually bifurcating, um, going into different sort of strands, and I'm going to show you a few of them today. Um, so there's going to be three sections. I'm sorry, I had to cross off one of them, which was the sort of deep learning on the cheap. Um, were any of you in Dan Ovid's uh, session earlier? Okay, actually a few of you, good. So, so Dan talked about microcontrollers and doing deep learning on the cheap. Um, this was going to be one of the sections, but I just didn't have enough content. So I apologize for that. Also, the other ones are just way too long to do in the session. So we're going to focus on three of them here, which is we're going to talk about language models. 
Um, and what happens when, when neural networks or you know, language models of some kind are able to produce text which is so compelling that you believe another human wrote it. Um, so what are the implications of that? Uh, we're going to do this fun section called iPod of the Future. We're going to get into a little bit of, um, well, kind of the same question except in the audio domain rather than in the text domain. So what happens when your favorite music uh, is coming from algorithms? You know, and, and actually to some degree it almost is already, um, depending on how dimly you look at the music industry. But, um, but what I mean is like when it's just generating, uh, generated on the spot for you. Um, you know, what's going to be, what will cause that to happen, where, where is the state of the art right now, and um, you know, how do, we, how do we respond to that, what's interesting about it, what's good, what's bad, um, and then we'll get into this decentralized AI, um, this decentralized AI topic, which is something I've been keenly interested in myself for the last few years, and actually this decentralized AI is really kind of a lead up to tomorrow. Uh, where we're going to talk about uh, the Abraham project, which is a, a project that I'm that I'm initiating, and so we'll we'll get much more into that tomorrow. Um, okay, cool. So let's talk about language models. How many of you have heard of char RNN? Okay, maybe half of you. So uh, char RNN is probably like the most popular project uh, or the most popular repository, let's say, that I've seen as a teacher in machine learning. Um, it's been around for a few years. I'm going to show you what it is, and I'll describe what this GPT-2 is. I know this doesn't make any sense right now for most of you, but, but you'll understand in, in a few minutes. Um, for the last few years, uh, one of the most popular elements of my class um, and, and lots of sort of creative machine learning workshops um, has been using this technique called char RNN, and char stands for character. It's a character level uh, recurrent neural network. So uh, I'll get into what that means in a second, but, but um, just read this for a second first to, to get a sense of what it can do. So this, what you're looking at is from the original blog post on Charanen by Andre Karpathy, uh, describing how to generate text character by character, trained on some data set, which looks like new text from that data set, and kind of resembles the, um, the, kind of, the kind of work that, uh, it kind of resembles the original training set. So this is fake Shakespeare. Right? Um, why Salisbury must find his flesh and thought, that which I am not apps, not a man in fire, um, to show the reigning of the raven in the wars, to grace my hand reproach within. So basically, producing text that sounds a little bit like Shakespeare, but um, is fake, fake spear, let's call it. And um, you know, if you read it for long enough, if you read it in the beginning, it sounds, it has the timbre of Shakespeare. It sounds like something that Shakespeare would write, but if you read it for long enough, you see that it doesn't make any sense. Um, and this aspect of Char RNN, that it produces text which is kind of amusing but doesn't make any sense, has been the butt of every Char RNN joke since, since I've seen Char RNN. Um, it's been really, really popular um, be, because it's kind of amusing, right? So you, you train it on some some serious text in it, like the Bible, let's say, and it produces fake biblical passages. And this um, is quite amusing, right? Um, and so this has been, and, and Char and you know, people could do lots of really creative things. This is some more stuff from Karpathy producing fake math papers. So it produces its own bogus, like, figures, because um, all the text, all textual. And so um, I've, I was, using char and to simulate presidential speeches, things like that. Um, just sort of lots of fun things like that. And also, um, you know, you could, you, could, you could train it on small text, you can train it on large text. So this was uh, made by Janelle Shane, basically um, April Fool's pranks. So she found the data set of short jokes describing April Fool's pranks that you could play and then produce new ones. So place a pair of pants and shoes in your ice dispenser. Um, yeah, glue all the eggs in the hubcaps of someone's computer. So why not? Um, so again, like uh, you know, funny text. That was sort of the the idea of Char and This was made by a former ITP student named Ross Goodwin. It's basically making up new words and defining them, lexiconjure. So you know, naturally, in a way that is appropriate or distinct. The country doesn't stop the network to accompany order. So things things of this this sort. Um, how many of you saw Sunspring when it came out? Again, this was made by Ross Goodwin, and it's basically a, 
a short film where the whole script was produced by a Chararian. So, and, it, and, it, and as you might imagine, the, um, the actual movie made no sense. And that was kind of the idea. So things that make no sense. Um, more of this nonsensical ML stuff. Uh, this is something that Robin Sloan made where he interacts. This is an author, um, best-selling author, in fact, where he interacts with an RNN, basically trying to co-write with the RNN. The RNN gives Robin some suggestions, what to write, um, and then you know he picks, he picks ones that he likes. So take us home, she said to the uh, computer. Computer said, "Keep out of the way, Jenny." Fine, <laughs> good. Um, now this this kind of developed for over a few years. So Char and N was kind of you know the the first sort of language. Uh, it wasn't the first language model, but it was the first. Um, language model, if you could call it that. It's not technically a language model, but, but um, to the extent that it resembles one, it was the first one that was kind of popular for artists and you know media artists and creatives and, and people, people of that ilk. And um, it kind of developed over a few years that we started to see different kinds of techniques for doing this. So um, the next stage was instead of modeling language at the character level, because that's not really modeling language, um, you model language at, a, uh, at something that makes more sense, which is at the word level. Um, and that was kind of the, um, the, the basis for skip dot vectors, which is some work by uh, Jamie Kiros in, in, I think, 2016. Basically using word vectors as the basic units by which to model the, uh, by which to model the language, embedding those word vectors. I'm going to have a few slides about what that means. And then uh, using those to produce sequences of words which seem to make more sense right so this was this this showed basically conditioned on some images where the text is made in response to an image so you feed it this image of a beach and it goes we were barely able to catch the breeze at the beach and it felt as if someone stepped out of my mind she was in love with him for the first time in months so she had no intention of escaping the sun had risen from the ocean. So this was trained on romance novels, I believe, which is why it sounds like that. Um, this is some work by Samim. Um, it's a friend of mine, another neural artist, uh, kind of riffing on these, applying them to um, different pictures. So, you know, Ben Bernanke, I think, some sumo wrestlers, just kind of amusing, amusing stuff. Still, mostly very amusing, right? And that was kind of the idea. Now, um, why are these language models, these, these language models that we were using, why were they so amusing? Why was that sort of the way that we would describe them? Um, language modeling is really hard. Um, it turns out that it's extremely hard because, and we take for granted just how hard it, uh, just how easy it is for us to process language. So when you listen to language, you, uh, you, know, you hear something and it instinctively makes sense to you. But you have no idea how much processing you're doing, uh, you're doing internally to understand, to, to get over the ambiguities of language. So this is my favorite example of this from Jeffrey Hinton. Um, listen to the following sentence. The trophy doesn't fit in the suitcase because it is too big. The trophy doesn't fit in the suitcase because it is too small. So in the first sentence, what is it? The trophy, right? And in the second sentence, what is it? The suitcase, right? So sentence at only one edit, and it changes what the pronoun refers to. So, so this is actually, you know, this, these are the kinds of intricacies that um, are required in order to understand, um, to deambiguate de 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 language as you hear it. Um, and, you know, this gets even worse because we, uh, mo most words, you know, they have a dictionary definition, and then they have connotation, which is how you understand the sort of framing of a word or maybe the, 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 the emotive quality of a word, right? There's so much more to language than, than definitions that um, it's incredibly difficult to model this for, um, you know, for scientists. And so for that reason, most of the language models we make, uh, most of the language models we've had, they make a lot of mistakes because they, they have a difficult time disambiguating all of these little intricacies and then we laugh at them. And so that's been kind of the, the, the basis for all the humor for the most part the last few years. 
So let me describe a little bit of how, how language modeling works. Um, and then we're, this is going to kind of lead up to the, the current heavyweight of language models, which is um, GPT-2. And then we'll talk about GPT-2 and why it's so crazy and what we can expect over the next few years about it. Uh, and maybe what we can do with it also. So first of all, um, uh, how many of you have, um, have either taken some introductory class on you know machine learning maybe creative machine learning maybe or or have potentially taken a class or workshop with me or watched something of mine online looks like three quarters of you something like that so so that's that's pretty good um, so maybe you're already familiar with some some basic elements I'm gonna kind of gloss over them because we're, we don't really it's beyond the scope of today to, to do an introductory lesson into this um, so I'll just kind of give you the high-level version of it, right? And, and for those of you who are interested in, uh, for those of you who don't have this background or want to refresh on it, I'll show you some links um, that you can go to um, for watching lectures about these things that are much longer um, on a website called ml4a.github.io, and I'll show you that later. So the idea is this. Um, we want to be able to represent images, sounds, text as vectors, vectors of statistics. Um, that describe or characterize those those units. Um, so, so for example, for an image, we might want an image is made up of pixels, right? And if you want to work with that as a data, as a you know, as some sort of an input, like a data input, it's uh, it's very difficult to make much use of it because all of the all of the pixels themselves are very low level information. They have very little meaning, um, and so what we're usually concerned with is trying to find a representation of the image which is more meaningful and this involves projecting the image into some what we call a feature vector and the feature vector you can think of it as a vector of numbers where the numbers correspond to some feature of the image so for images of dogs you know one feature might be might be something like uh, how big are its ears or you know the um, or maybe like the the shape of its mouth or something like that um, and you know features uh, the, if you have a data set of dogs they might be all specific to dogs if you have a data set of other kinds of other kinds of images then those features will be more specific to um, to that data set and the features are learned through the process of training a neural network or some other machine learning model um, which models the data set and once you have these representations you can project any image into one of these feature vectors and then do all sorts of things all sorts of cool things with them so for example um, so yeah this is okay well I don't have slides about that but for example with images you might be able to do something like calculate how similar two images are to each other and the way you would do that is by simply subtracting one of their feature vectors from the other and then you know doing a distance calculation so something like that and you could also um, do things like use them for classification or regression um, or, or, or other um, basically image processing tasks. So that's how that would work for images. Now for text this is a little weirder, right? Because, um, well okay, so for, for the, this it won't seem any weirder than images for most of you because we haven't described how, how it's actually done. Um, so maybe it's not any weirder, but for text it's a little bit more unclear because you know we don't have like what is the data of a word it's not actually um, it's not a bunch of numbers like a like an image is an image of pixels it's just a word and so but we still want to achieve the same idea we want to be able to project words into vectors so that we can do operations with those vectors like calculate how similar they are to each other or use them as the basis of some some language modeling task um, so so how how does that work? Well, um, and so and what do I mean by embeddings, right? What do I mean by um, these feature vectors? So okay, like I said before, with images, feature vectors characterize the image. So let's say your feature vector is a hundred dimensions. You have a hundred numbers. So then you can think of every possible image as being a point in that one hundred dimensional feature space. So like for for something like um, for images, you might have a cluster of images which are dogs and they're very, going to be very close to each other because images of dogs have similar features and maybe they're kind of close to the image of a cat right the cat is kind of close because cats and dogs have similar features but farther away are things like um, cars and um, you know 
houses and things like that. Um, and sounds, you know, you can embed them as well. We're not going to talk about sounds. Um, and with something like word vectors, again, this is beyond their scope. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm going to skip some slides because I, I probably have way too many slides. Um, but you can use different uh, techniques for deriving those vectors. Um, these are two of the most popular that have been around for a few years, these, these kind of language models. The idea is that you train a language model to predict the next word in the sequence of words. And um, you, are, you have to der you derive good feature vectors such that, um, such that your, your language model is accurate in, in predicting the next word in, in some uh, sequence of words. The cool thing about these word vectors is that, um, that relationships, right? It's not, it's not just that, um, that similar words, and similar I mean with a caveat kind of, but it's not just that similar words appear close to each other, it's also that the relationships between words are actually preserved in this geometric space. So for example, there's, um, if you look at the vector so if you embed a whole bunch of words and then you look at where the vector for king is and the vector for queen and then you draw a vector between them like an arrow and then you find the vector between man and woman you'll see that it's similar right because it's a gender vector right so there's a gender there's a gendering vector there are part of speech vectors there are country and capital uh, vectors there's a lot of really interesting relationships that you can derive um, and this has been also something um, that lots of people have kind of played with. Um, now, um, so yeah, something l like with words, right? You should you should observe that relations between words have similar um, similar uh, directions, directional vectors between them. Um, oh yeah, and then you could do things like, okay, well, if this is the if this is the vector from woman to man, queen to king, then what about duchess to duke? So you can basically guess where that would be. Um, if you're interested in working with word vectors, you should definitely um, use the implementation ML5. How many people here are familiar with ML5? Okay, this is a big, um, kind of a big research project here at ITP. Um, a bunch of a bunch of students are working on making a JavaScript-based machine learning library. It's super easy to use, very very functional, um, and it has a nice word vector implementation that you should check out. Um, now, okay, with language modeling, you, 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 um, in some kinds of models, it may be desirable not to embed words, but to embed entire sentences, you know, or paragraphs, or basically unbounded amounts of text. So, for example, um, if, if you were to make a, uh, a sentence encoder, you might observe the same ideas where two sentences that, that are characterized by some relationship um, that relationship might reoccur in other sentences. So for example, the hardware store is in Queens, where is the hardware store? So one question is the, uh, so one sentence is the question inversion of the other. So then maybe, if you find the sentence, the mouse ate the cheese, then the sentence, what did the mouse eat, there's going to be some question inversion vector there. Um, so that's kind of a, a neat little property of sentence encoders. Um, and um, and so on. I think we already mentioned this. Yeah, sorry, I have some some repeats. Um, there's uh, for those who want to play with sentence encoders. There's a really nice one on uh, on um, that you can work with online in the on Colab, which is this platform for basically that Google made that lets you just run code in your browser. There's, a, there's something called the Universal Sentence Encoder, and what the Universal Sentence Encoder will do is it'll give you it'll embed any sentence into a feature vector which characterizes that sentence and then you can use that as the basis of whatever tasks so for example you can measure how similar two sentences are um, or maybe you can do something like embed you have some data set of sentences and you embed them all and then you can pick two endpoints and then draw a line between one sentence and the other and then pick out a whole bunch of sentences in between them um, and then see how one sentence evolves into another. So this is all sort of like pretty fun stuff that you could do with, with sentence encoders. Um, okay, we'll skip that. There's some cool stuff about historical text. Um, I'm gonna kind of fly over to this, yeah. Um, now, this uh, making uh, language modeling has been uh, 
one of the huge, one of the biggest areas of inquiry in machine learning for a long time. We communicate in language. You know, we uh, most of our communication is is done online using text, and so natural language processing has tons and tons of applications, and um, and so lots of research scientists have been trying to figure out ways of of understanding language better for ta so that you can do things like translation very easily. Um, you might have noticed over the last few years how much better translation services have become, um, and and almost all of that has been driven by deep learning. Um, now, uh, the late kind of one of the latest state of the arts in that is this project by by from Facebook Research, where they basically did this thing where they made a sort of an arbitrary sentence to sentence translation uh, from be between any two languages. Um, I shouldn't say any two languages, but the, but a set of languages that they trained on. And um, nor what, what's really cool about this is that normally, in order to train a neural network to do, to do translation from one language into another, let's say you want to do English to French translation, you need a data set of English and French, a parallel data set where you have one sentence in English and then the corresponding sentence in French. And you know you need this for many sentences, hundreds of thousands or millions even, if you want to do a good job. Um, now this is this works pretty well, um, but it's a little bit limited because you need a parallel data set, and that's not always available, right? Um, especially with languages that are rare, um, or you know, uh, I mean, most language pairs you don't have a have a data set of this kind. And so the really cool thing about this uh, this work from from Facebook. Is that instead of uh, instead of doing this, uh, instead of ge generating a translation models by using parallel text, they took a different approach, and they got just a whole bunch of data sets of different languages that they wanted to model, and they and they took their word they took the word vectors, um, they they basically derived word vectors for each language, and then they this is very hard to describe, <laughs> they found a way to project every single language into the same vector space. So you kind of analyze, it's really like, like not every possible mapping works, right? What's going on? <laughs> um, what, not every possible mapping works in a way that would give you coherent translation, right? And so you're able to kind of analyze and find it find a projection of, of the feature vector space for one language into the same space for a, a second language. Something like that. You're able to do it for all of the languages all at once, more or less. Uh, Are you yeah. using language? Uh, I'm sorry? Are you using something in language? So the, well the, it's funny that you mention that because this is what the next slide is about. So when when this was announced, like the whole media, basically, that's how they interpreted it. They were like, because the way that the research paper puts it is that there's some, you know, we're trying to embed all languages into a common sort of language space. Um, and so, um, and so, all of the newspapers and the, you know, the the media kind of started talking about how Facebook created its own language and they had to shut it down because it started doing all sorts of crazy stuff. Um, and and this is kind of like, this is very misleading because that's not exactly what was happening. What was happening is this sort of like relatively mundane. I mean, it's not mundane, but it's um, it's just, you know, mathematical projection into one feature space. It's still kind of regression. I'm sorry? It's still regression. It's um, not, it, mm, I mean, not, not exactly. Uh, it's a projection. Let's call it a projection, yeah. Um, okay, so let's get to GPT-2. So the latest and the greatest thing that I'll, I'll mention is this GPT-2. How many people here have heard of this GPT-2? Okay. Um, so this was um, announced by OpenAI a few months ago, I think in February. We're going to open this link, actually. Um, where? Who? Oh, OpenAI is a company that was uh, founded, I think, about three years ago to do... Um, sort of machine, like deep learning research. Um, they're semi-independent. I think they were initially founded by, I think they were, it was like an Elon Musk venture. I think he left though. Um, but in any case, they're, they're kind of, um, they're one of the major 
AI research companies that are out there today. They're super interested in safety in particular, so they're, they're kind of maybe leading research into safe AI and secure AI. Um, and, um, and yeah, you know, they have this mission of making, making AI good for people, something like that. Like, do no evil kind of stuff, you know. Um, in any case, they announced this uh, language model that they developed called GPT-2 based on an architecture uh, called Transformers. And we're not going to get into we're not going to get into that exactly how they work, but the point is that they're incredibly coherent. They produce really, really realistic text. So I'm going to show you a few samples that they released. Um, the way it works is that it's a language model, so it just produces text. And they're, the way they set it up was that they have a uh, a system prompt. So basically, the network is kind of primed with some input. So you write a sentence or a paragraph, and then the model completes your thought, more or less. It just begins to write more like that. Um, and I mean, it's pretty naive. It doesn't do something like a question and answering task. It's just a, it just speaks, more or less. Um, so here's an example. And this is a, a pretty neat one. I think they did a lot of curation, but, but I mean, it's still pretty neat. So the, the prompt, what a human writes, is in a shocking finding, Scientists discovered a herd of unicorns living in a remote, previously unexplored valley in the Andes Mountains. Even more surprising to the researchers was the fact that the unicorns spoke perfect English. So, um, so they wrote a prompt about English-speaking unicorns, and then so which is pretty obscure, you would think. I don't know how much uh, they, they trained it on 40 gigabytes of internet text, and you know who knows how much of it was on English-speaking unicorns. Uh, nevertheless, the model was able to write the following. The scientists named the population after their distinctive horn, Ovid's unicorn. These four-horned silver-white unicorns were previously unknown to science. Now, after almost two centuries, the mystery of what sparked this odd phenomenon is finally solved. Dr. Jorge Perez, an evolutionary biologist from the University of La Paz, and several companions were exploring the Andes Mountains when they found a small valley with no other animals or humans. Perez noted that the valley had what appeared to be a natural fountain surrounded by two peaks of rock and silver snow. So, and it goes on like this. And it's pretty impressive, right? I mean, maybe, maybe if you look at it hard enough, you might think that it's kind of, kind of weird, but it looks pretty plausible that a human could have written it. Um, they have a few more samples. These are highly curated. So they said that, you know, maybe one out of every five or 10 would be really, really good. And, you know, the others would be a little bit, they would be some sort of a tell. But they're pretty pretty good. Um, oh, I don't like this one. Sorry, there's it down there. Um, how about? Oh, this is this is the great one. This is meta. So they actually then they fed it their own text. We've trained a large language model called GPT-2 that generates realistic paragraphs of text, while also exhibiting zero-shot generalization on tasks like machine translation, question answering, reading comprehension, and summarization. Blah blah blah. Um, then they wrote. Here you can, so then the model writes, here you can see the most recent progress with generative pre-trained transformer. Figure one, generative pre-trained transformer training on several texts. We are now preparing a collection of data sets for translation and machine translation in our language model. We will be using one of the large number of text samples provided by the New York Times. We believe this project is the first step, blah, blah, blah. So it generalizes really, really well. Um, and then they also released, I think, um, yeah, so stuff with like, Legolas and Gimli, that's from, uh, what is it? Lord of the Rings, right? Um, then, but then um, there's one, the last one I think, yeah. Okay, this, one is, this one's kind of telling. So here's the prompt. Recycling is good for the world. No, you could not be more wrong, right? So, um, so then the model completion goes, recycling is not good for the world. It is bad for the environment, it is bad for our health, and it is bad for our economy. Mm -hmm. I'm not kidding. Recycling is not good for the environment. It is destructive to the earth, and it is a major contributor to global warming. Recycling is not good for our health. It contributes to obesity and, and diseases like heart disease and cancer. Recycling is bad for our economy. It increases the cost of a product, and in turn, the price of everything that is made with that product. Um, I think part of the reason why they use this as a sample is because is, is, is the following. So when they, when they uh, wrote this blog post, they actually decided not to release the model. So, um, because, and they cited you know, malicious uses of the model, like if they released it online, people could use it to 
to you know cite to, to create fake news or you know impersonate people you know all sorts of like really really fun stuff like that trump. and sorry trump. trump what about him yeah i mean you know uh, and you know so so that was we'll, we'll get back to this but the the point is that they they said this was too dangerous you know um even though there, even though this has been, this has been, I mean, it was kind of an incremental step from stuff that was around before, but you know, who's who's to say? Um, they decided not to release the model. They released a smaller version of it instead, and then and then later they released a medium-sized version. Um, what's really, but they, but of course they have the paper where they describe precisely how everything was done. They assembled forty gigabytes of internet text, not too difficult, um, and then they trained a really really gigantic neural network to model that text. Now, um, there's two limitations of this, right? First of all, uh, or why it's difficult. One is that, of course, it's difficult to assemble a data set, uh, but also it requires a ton of computation. So it's estimated something like $50,000 of computation would be required to train one of these models. And so, um, so then a few weeks ago, um, this, um, some undergraduate in Munich named Connor Leahy, um, probably like 20 years old or something like that, um, wrote on Twitter, hey OpenAI, I've replicated GPT-2, the, the major model, in full and plan on releasing it to the public on July 1st. I sent you an email with the model uh, for my reasoning why he, he wrote this blog post on Medium, which was an absolute manifesto. I mean, it was like this some one hour long, you know, like rambling, completely, completely deranged, like, I mean, he's a college student, so, you know, I, if no anyone's in college, I, I don't mean to. You know. <laughs> so you're not the first person who, who, who actually, yes, yes, maybe he did. Um, but, well, okay, he decided, uh, I'm going to release this model, made a big, big, uh, you know, huff, huff and puff on Twitter, uh, and then wrote this post talking about why it must be released to the public, and one week later, OpenAI got in touch with him, and he's like, okay, I'm not going to release it. Um, so, you know, you, one can only guess what OpenAI offered him to, to not release the model online. Probably they offered him some sort of a job, um, you know, waiting for him. But obviously, Connor must be very, very, very pleased. Do you know what they said? What they said? What OpenAI said? Uh, it's not clear. Um, I think he wrote another blog post about it where they, where they, you know, where they told him you know, the safety concerns and, you know, thing, things of that sort. I mean, you know, who knows? Um, but in any case, like, why don't we ask, the, why don't we pose the question now? Um, you know, should they release the model? What would happen if they did? Um, you know, what, what is the appropriate way to deal with these, these language models? What can they do, first of all? Um, so what are these language models? What, what, what should we expect that they're going to be doing in our future? So they're going to be generating articles, obviously. They're going to be personal assistants. Um, you know, you'll have your own sort of language-speaking personal assistant. You know, you have duplexes, which are these AIs that can call up, you know, pizza restaurants and order pizza for you, things like that. Uh, but of course, they have all these purported malicious techniques and malicious applications as well. You can generate tons of fake social media and bots. Um, you know, put them put them on Twitter or something like that, you know, because no one's doing that already. Um, generate product reviews, fake product reviews, um, you know, generate trolls online, impersonate people, make books and, and lyrics. I spelled lyrics wrong, sorry. Um, that's a different lyric, actually. <laughs> um, movies and so on. It's a lot of interesting stuff. Um, so so I want to, just, just for like two minutes or something, because we're running late, um, I want to toss this up to the question. Uh, toss this, toss this question up to the audience. What do you think? Like, uh, yeah. I mean, for me, it sounds first impression that it should be legalized drugs. <laughs> but it's uh, kind of like the same kind of question. Like, it should be. It should be re-legalized. What was it? No, I'm just saying, like, that's the same kind of problem. It's like should be legalized drugs. It's like, oh, there is something. It's malicious to people, so we won't protect people from it. So we make it illegal. And the question is like, is it better to release something yeah. to, to, to learn how to deal with it instead of like taking it away? Right. So their, their justification was that they're releasing it gradually so that we can kind of scale up our defenses over time. Yeah, maybe. 
Well, yeah, I think you had your hand first. I think like if um, students and the students, I'm sure that some more people can just see that people in the students can stop on the homepage. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, the the recycling one really got me thinking. At what point does it move from imitating language and arguments to true reasoning? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Not not in terms of consciousness, but at what point are, is the uh, is it able to map out enough of the uh, you know the structure and the structure behind the language? That it's actually making its own uh, coherent points, not just predictively from what it's read. Um, well, the question maybe I should turn it back on you. What would convince you that it uh, that it is? Probably novel arguments. So I mean, the the uh, that was supposedly novel text. It wasn't just reading people off the internet. It wasn't. It wasn't copying and pasting. You know, it's a language model, so it's producing text, which is. I mean, you know, does anyone have novel thoughts, or aren't all words, you know, all are all sentences, combinations of previous words? It's a little bit. It's a bit of a unfalsifiable, you know, um, immeasurable kind of you know, thing. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. really lowers the entry bar for everyone else. So I guess I really wonder why they put out the paper in enough detail to replicate it if they were truly concerned about their ramifications. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Over there. I think, um, in general, a lot of people kind of talk about their benefits that were in sort of like a wild west of like AI and how it would Okay, all, all super nice commentary. Um, I'm going to, to l let that uh, kind of simmer. And you guys can kind of think about it for a little while. And we'll move on to the, to the next topic. Um, okay, iPod of the future. I really like this one. Um, well, <laughs> I mean, I made all of them, I guess. But okay, well, uh, what, I, what am I talking about? So uh, this is very close to my heart because I got interested in machine learning through the context of audio, through music. I have a background in a field called music information retrieval. Anybody familiar with that here? Okay, handful of you. So um, this field uh, is all about basically extracting information from musical data. And that could be audio or it could be musical me metadata um, and using it for various applications. Um, with music information retrieval, um, how many of you have Spotify, for example? And so. You know, you, your Spotify recommends music to you. It has a music recommendation engine. So this is kind of a good MIR task, is recommendation of music, um, gauging the similarity of two songs to each other, um, also doing things like, like useful things like identifying music. Have you ever used Shazam or, SoundCloud or SoundHound or something like that, where it identifies a piece of music on the radio for you? Um, or maybe uh, it identifies if it's a cover song, or identifies if it's a copyright violation. That's that's their favorite. Um, that's their favorite one. Um, and uh, then doing things like analyzing audio, so tracking the beats, um, segmenting audio, sort of unmixing it, uh, transcription, and 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 um, you know giving you um, you know giving you the key the key detection, classification of metadata like genre tags. Um, creating playlists, and then the holy grail, of course, is hit song prediction. So this has been um, something that everyone's wanted to do for a really, really long time. Turns out it's really difficult. Um, now, um, let's just see kind of, oh man, 5.57. So we have about until 6.30, we started a little bit late. 
Hmm, okay, let me actually, yeah, I'll kind of fly through some of these slides just so we can, we have a little bit of time for decentralized AI stuff. So the, the um, there's multiple ways of representing audio. There's kind of symbolic approaches, right? And everyone's kind of familiar with notes, music notes, MIDI, things like that. Audio is just raw audio, right? So your samples of audio. Um, and of course, you also have metadata, things like that. What's going on? Oh, it's Friday, right? So there's it's pizza day, right? Okay, well, um, now um, let me skip this actually. Let's skip. Um, let's. Okay, so there's kind of a really interesting history for um, of audio, right? And, and the the crazy thing is that we've only had audio like as a thing for like just over a hundred years. Um, so the first recordings of audio came from from the you know the late nineteenth century, um, and this is kind of um, this is really. Uh, famous ethnomusicologist recording um, like indigenous peoples um, speaking, uh, recording their languages and so on. Um, and over time, we developed more sophisticated techniques of working with audio. We developed tape decks. Um, we developed, you know, basically machines and eventually computers for working with audio. Um, and the field of, uh, and the the field of electronic music was born. Right, so. Um, electronic music was all about trying to make sounds that did not originate acoustically, right? So um, electronic electronic sounds are synthesized, right? It's not there's no physical um, there's nothing physical happening that causes the sounds to be uh, to be you know burst from thin air, but they're actually synthesized, right? And this was kind of was was really the first time we were able to make music with completely synthetic sound, and that inspired. Uh, music concrete and electronic music basically in the 40s through 60s actually <coughs> there was a really there was a th um, <coughs> in Japan there was actually concurrent to this there was actually a lot of the same um, kind of stuff being rediscovered um, at the same time kind of completely independently which is really interesting I don't know too much about it but it's for, for people who are like interested in the history of, of uh, music it's definitely something to especially electronic music definitely something to look into um, okay, how many people know where this place is? Is there Google? No. Is it where? Is it no. Uh, <laughs> come on, this can't be Google. Look at it. <laughs> it's like this is chef. Huh? No, 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 no. Okay, this is this is up in 125th Street um, here in New York. It's it's part of Columbia University's campus, although it's kind of far away. Um, this is Prentice Music Hall. So this is kind of where I learned my craft. Um, and if you go there, you'll find this machine standing there. This is the first electronic music synthesizer ever built. Um, and it's standing on 125th Street in front of this music hall um, at the, um, yeah. And it's, it's quite a device. This thing, basically, you can do, it's, it's like a submarine panel. I mean, it's really, really rad. Um, it takes up the whole room and it kind of still works. They can kind of dust it off a little bit and make it make so sound sometimes. And um, all of this can be simulated in, in a tiny device now, you know, basically. Um, but but it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty cool that they still have this thing kind of working. Um, these are, <laughs> Do you have some kind of face right there? Uh, yeah, because, because the way that um, this, was, this goes back before programming languages. So the way that you make a machine do something was by basically feeding it I mean, the program would be, would be, yeah, yeah, exactly, punch cards and stuff. Um, actually, I don't know if that's what's being done here. I'm not 100% sure what these are, um, but, but I presume something like that, yeah. Um, this is the thing today. These are some of my old professors. Um, listen to this. This is the first piece of programmed music in, the his in history. done by oops, um, this was done by this guy right here Max Matthews um, who's a pioneer in in, um, in electronic music he actually died just I think about maybe about two years ago anyone here ever use Max MSP so Max MSP was named after him um, big big name in the field um, 
really like wonderful guy. Um, everyone, everyone really loved him. He was kind of, he was always like until the end, just kind of working with new instruments, super excited about, you know, electronic music and, and tools and so on. Um, you know, kind of a pioneer in the field. So um, over time, the, uh, what happened was that we became, uh, the computer, computers obviously got better and better. And from the 80s through the early 2000s, there was a big burst in what's called physical modeling. So physical modeling says the following. Let's say you want to be able to create electronic uh, musical instruments that sound like you know, guitars and flutes and pianos and drums and things like that. Well, how are they made in real life, right? Those are all acoustic sounds. You can, um, you can try to model them, their physical phenomena. You can actually model the physical phenomena and then, and then try to derive um, the actual audio that they would make in, you know, it, um, in meat space, let's call it. Um, and this was only, we were only really able to do this starting in the, maybe there were some currents in the 70s, but, but it kind of became big through the 80s and 90s because at that point computers were fast enough to do these kinds of operations and there were some expressive um, programming languages that allowed us to, to kind of model physical phenomena. And um, so we started creating, th this was the early period of digital music. And so, I don't know, has anyone ever listened to music from the 80s and, you know, and the 90s? And, you know, it has a particular aesthetic, right? It's like the sounds are very, very, um, like they're, they're kind of, they're very clean. You know, they're very, very sort of, uh, uh, well, you know, they don't sound like they came from the real world, right? Because, because, you know, you can model a few processes, but you can't capture all the dynamics of the world. You know, there's too much noise in there. Uh, but nevertheless, we were able to make really good vocal models and piano models, um, string models, and so on. And those became the basis of a lot of early software for making electronic and computer music. Um, now, um, so uh, this is actually like how one of the things, the ways that I became interested in machine learning was was working with these physical models um, along with friends of mine trying to create electronic musical instruments, novel electronic instruments. So this thing right here is called a burl. It's an electronic sort of wind instrument that was built by a friend of mine named Jeff Snyder. And we, it's a controller, doesn't make any sound. Really strange sounds coming from the oh Friday night. Um, okay, well, so I um, so this thing doesn't make any sound by itself. It's just a controller, but you can hook it up to a digital synthesizer, and then you can do something like use a um, you can use a machine learning model to learn a relationship between the input sensors and the output parameters for the synthesizer, and the synthesizer is some physical model of a wind instrument, something like that. So this is what that sounds like. This is actually a, a professional flautist playing. It's got a Pedro Eustache. What happens? So it, there's a, a breath pressure and embouchure sensor on the mouthpiece. And then also these capacitor touch sensors. capture that okay now um, we're skipping a whole lot of time so so fast forward to 2015 um, so one thing one thing is I just want to say this as a personal note because like I was really I, I uh, when I got interested in music information retrieval making like making audio samples of audio from uh, entirely with machine learning seemed like a huge impossibility and the reason is it's really difficult to model that many numbers. Like to create samples of audio, there's 44,000 roughly per, per second of audio. Um, so that's, you know, modeling 44,000 numbers in sequence per second is, it just seems like a her Herculean task. Um, and so it took a really, really long time for us to be able to do that. We're starting to make progress in it. Uh, one of the first um, attempts to this was uh, that was uh, that was open sourced was this repository called Groove 
G GRU is actually a type of recurrent neural network, uh, neural network cell related to LSTM. Um, and basically, but it sounds kind of cool because it's like Groove. <laughs> and, um, and it was released online. Uh, I think, yeah. Sounded, so that was basically a groove trained on. Um, oh, who was the piano? Not not Eric Satie. It's like the Chopin. Yeah, Chopin. Uh, actually, it's overfitting, it, uh, which means that it basically it tricked me. It sounded like I had generated coherent Chopin, but but really I just kind of like memorized some Chopin, and then put a whole bunch of noise on top of it. So it's kind of cheating. <laughs> Same thing, uh, John Coltrane. You hear the so it, because um, it's very difficult to so it, most most combinations of samples of audio sound like noise, and so unless you model something very very nicely correctly. Um, you're gonna get a lot of noise, and so you know that's kind of where it's just noise in the signal. Um, it's literally in inaccurate samples. Like if you take a piece of audio and you take all the samples and you add a little bit of random noise to them, you know because they're inaccurate, that's what it would sound like. Yeah. Sorry. You you sure? Yeah, yeah. Why, why not add certain kinds of? physics rules that kind of constrain that, like a key can only resonate for so long, or... So, I mean, you can, but then but then you're just back to physical modeling. And now, now of course, like, that, that's kind of useful if, exa if, you're, if you know exactly what you want to model. But, the, but the part of the idea of machine learning, what it's for, or what we want to do with AI, is for it to generalize. So we, we would like to encode as little information, in, as little sort of handcrafted information into it as possible, so that, it, so that the same algorithm can be repurposed for various tasks. Uh, I, I guess my question is, for us in the real world, you know, our intelligence, we're not coming up with all this stuff. We only know the rules about how to act on certain things. And then there's all these physical systems that we're activating that kind of you know, have the built-in rules, like when you're operating a guitar. Um, and over here, it sounds like it's actually free to just draw wherever it wants from the audience spectrum. Yeah, pretty um, much, yeah. <laughs> That's the idea. They they wanted to learn, basically, without any you know um, interference. Let's say. It's not what you would use to like program like a pianist. Um, no, not exactly. Uh, no, because it's generating audio, not not MIDI. Okay, so check, listen to this. It's hard to hear, right? Um, I, it's pr you probably can't hear it very well in the back, but there's basically some piano being played by um, by um, by D uh, this was a, a scientist named Sandra Gilliman at DeepMind. They produced really really coherent sounding piano, not very noisy, using a, a system called they designed called wave nets. And wave nets have um, wave nets were really the first really serious like um, music modeling machine learning models that I that I had heard um, or that anyone had heard for that matter yeah um, and what was really cool about this actually was that it was open sourced so it was it was reverse engineered by some scientists uh, actually by by basically students um, and um, so you can still see this online I, I trained it on opera so I like tried to find a whole bunch of opera and just threw it all at WaveNet and it made Yeah. So I mean it's kind of noisy but you hear like did you hear like a little bit of the the sort of there's this opera it, it's almost like it sounds like kind of when an orchestra is tuning plus just some tenor screaming and you know like the you know i don't know like can you hear that last 
masterpiece. Anyway, um, here's something cool. This was another architecture called Sample RNN, which actually used a recurrent neural network, similar for um, some. Of the, this is the same kind of uh, system that you use for char RNN. And um, this. So a friend of mine basically made a friend of mine basically made a an eternal live stream of generated death metal. Yeah, so you can you can live stream this. It's re called Relentless Doppelganger. It was trained on a band called I forget which band. Um, trained on Archspire, Archspire, some sort of a death metal band, and and it's just producing endless death metal on live stream, eternally, forever. <laughs> I don't see any comments from the band. Oh, maybe they are disabled. What, the comments? No, the comments are here. You know, there's... No. But anyway, yeah, just some fun stuff. Okay. Um, yeah, some more work in WaveNet. Sander showed, like, long-term coherence. Uh, I'm going to skip this time. Go, go. Um, and as like WaveNet like architectures, so WaveNet was kind of repurposed for modeling musical instruments. Um, some work from Magento, which is at Google, making really cool musical instruments. So some of you might be interested in that. Um, some stuff with MIDI. I want to skip this actually. Um, yeah, no genie. Uh, okay. Also um, modeling people's voices. So this is a service called Lyrebird which um, last time I checked their demo was down, but, you, but before you could actually have it model your voice. So they would ask you to speak into the microphone for 10 minutes and say a whole bunch of things. And then you'd be able to, you'd have a model of your own voice that you could use to, to make it say stuff. Hey Doc, have you heard well, about so this, this new technology? Technology? You're speaking about this new algorithm to copy voices. Um, yes, it is developed by a startup called Lyrebird. This is huge, they can make us say anything, now really anything. The good news is that they will offer the technology to anyone. This is huge. How does their technology work? Hey guys, I think that they use deep learning and artificial neural networks. Hillary is right. I can tell you that their team is great. I wish them good luck. I'm sure they will do it's a good job. impressive, stealing voices, right? And, and uh... Oak is strong and also gives shade. The pipe began to rust while new. Thieves who rob friends deserve jail. The ripe taste of cheese improves with age. Cats and dogs each hate the other. Move the vat over the hot fire. The hog crawled under the high fence. Act on these orders with great speed. <laughs> anyway, um, I think their demo it was down last time I checked, but okay. Wave low, this is some stuff with GANs. Oh, yeah, well, we got too much stuff. Uh, audio texture synthesis. Okay, I wanted to get to this whole iPod of the future concept. Okay, so the idea is, um, is this, and I'm, I'm gonna use some more work from, some, from Sander Dillman. So, um, you can use, uh, like, <laughs> this is gonna be really difficult to finish off with. Um, no one told me that this is... Anyway, okay. Um, Sander Dilleman is this research scientist at, at DeepMind um, who, who did a research, some research in content-based music recommendation. So how does music recommendation generally work, like on Spotify and other services? It mostly uses something called collaborative filtering. Collaborative filtering doesn't take the audio into account at all. It, um, it just tries to recommend music based on listening habits. You know, so it, the, the core idea is this. If you find someone who has a similar music taste to you, they like most of the same bands, then you can recommend music that they're listening to to you. Um, you know, bands that they've listened to that you haven't, right? Because you probably have a similar taste, so maybe you like the same band. So it's all social data, right? Now this has some, some issues. One is that it becomes very difficult to, uh, to predict new music for people. So like to actually, uh, when there's new bands and stuff, there's kind of a cold start problem as it's called. Um, and so it would be desirable to be able to do this directly from audio. So 
Um, the idea with this research was um, uh, to try to predict uh, whether someone's going to like a piece of music directly from the audio. So the way that it works is this. You remember we talked about embeddings, right? So this idea of embedding uh, words or sentences or or images into some feature space. So the idea of content-based recommendation is that you try to embed songs or albums or artists or whatever it is you're interested in into a feature space and then embed users into the same space. So the idea is that two songs are similar if they're close to each other in that feature space. Um, they're, they're dissimilar if they're far apart. And the idea is that you can also embed users into the same space. It's like their affinity towards a particular set of features. Um, what you know how much they like those features uh, oops and so the idea is that this is a good recommendation for this user um, these are bad recommendations and so on and um, again like I don't have enough time to talk about this in much detail so I'm, I'm gonna kind of leave it in the abstract but the idea is that you can train a, um, a model which projects users and um, users and songs into the same feature space uh, as a, and you can treat it as a regression problem that goes directly from the audio into these latent factors, as we call them. They're the features that we're, that we're interested in in, um, in modeling. Um, I have to skip some of this because it's a little bit it's it's a little bit too low level. But okay, the idea is that um, it does a really really it does a pretty decent job. It, what he found was that content based music recommendation actually doesn't work that well yet. At least it doesn't work as well as collaborative filtering. I mean, it has some advantages. It doesn't recommend more Daft Punk for Daft Punk, let's say, um, but um, but it just but you know it's a little bit doesn't work super well. But maybe in the future it might work pretty well. Um, now the reason why I want to mention this uh, research is because I want to put a very evil thought into your minds about music. So if you, suppose that we were able to do this very well, that we were able to basically project all songs and um, and users into a very good, into a very coherent, um, subjectively meaningful feature space. So users like these features. And, the, and features can be things like, you know, uh, consistent beat, uh, very harmonious, you know, um, has lots of major seven chords, you know, jazzy, jazzy syncopation, some musical features, right? And suppose you could do this with a high degree of accuracy, subjective accuracy. Well, um, you can tie these two things, this, this together, with something like WaveNet. Okay, here's the idea. WaveNet is a generative model of audio. The generative, generative models in general can be conditioned on some input label. It can be conditioned on some other features. Like you can, for example, condition, as you saw in the vocal model, you can condition, condition a, a voice model on a vocal identity. So you can listen to Trump or to Obama or to me or whoever, right? Or maybe you can condition it on a language, you know, like uh, what is what is what does audio sound like from an English speaker versus from a French speaker and so on, right? Well, what if you made a wave net that generated musical musical audio that was conditioned on the very same latent factors that you had a sort of taste profile for for all the users well okay then in theory you could just synthesize music for you know each of these particular users you could synthesize music that is exactly which is which is uh well um you know which is custom tailored to a particular user perhaps at a particular time like maybe you're also conditioning it on some sort of biometric data that you're reading or something like that i'm just trying to be as dystopian as possible um, so generating music on the spot for every single person you have your own personal ipod generating music which has never been generated before it's like every time you listen to a, a piece of music it's optimized for for you for you at that very moment whatever mood you happen to be in perhaps and uh, you'll only hear it that one time, right? So we're just generating endless amounts of audio for everybody, their own personal iPod. Um, so, so okay, well, um, <laughs> this is, I, I don't even wanna get into this part. Um, okay, the, um, so yeah, where does that leave musicians? Um, well, um, is, is, is it sound to you like a very dystopian thought? Like maybe there will be no more musicians? <laughs> no, well, I'm a musician. 
I, oh, no, 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 don't kill me. I actually have a very optimistic thought. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Pay so much money to go. Yeah, yeah. Although, although, um, although the music is made by by people, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to make this one final optimistic note, which is that um, it turns out that as we get better and better at automating things, then the ratio of uh, how much things are uh, priced, let's say, that are handcrafted, the ratio of those things to things that are automated um, actually gets higher. So basically things that are made by other humans become more and more valuable. Um, and so I think personally, I'm also a musician sometimes, not, not a very good one. Um, my optimistic note is that, you know, people have, this might destroy the music industry, but the music industry has been only around for like a hundred like years, barely. Um, people have been making music for way longer than that. And as long as people have an impulse to, to make sound, which is musical in some ways, we're going to have plenty of uh, human musicians. So there will always be a, a place for us at the table. Yeah, yeah. Yeah? Maybe you will be replaced by your own algorithm. <laughs> I, maybe. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so we kind of ran out of time before the last segment. I was going to do this whole decentralized AI segment. I'm really sorry. However, for those of you who are going to be with me tomorrow for the introduction to Abraham, it's, it's, it's more or less this plus, plus some other stuff. And so I'm going to talk a lot about this decentralized AI stuff. For those of you who, um, who don't know what I'm talking about, I'm, I'm teaching a session tomorrow at... I think it's at one or something like that. I forget exactly. But for those of you who are interested, I'm going to talk about this 
what happens when you can do machine learning at scale in a decentralized and private, privacy preserving um, way and what are some of the cool new applications that will enable and I'm introducing a project at, uh, about this called Abraham which is a project to create an autonomous artificial artist. I don't have any time to, to get into what that means right now. Just imagine it's an artist making, making, making art for us from the cloud, let's say. Um, and I'll, I'll describe exactly what I mean by that all tomorrow, so please do join me if you haven't signed up already. And uh, I think that's all. Um, if there are any questions, like let me know. And uh, have a good rest of your uh, weekend in camp. So, yeah. Ciao. Uh, these are all the slides, so you can also see them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna release the video and stuff and put it all online. Uh, yeah, okay, cool.